Southeast Radio's Business Matters with Carl Fitzpatrick. Well, Mary Darlington's new book, Safety Sorted, is the culmination of three decades of health and safety experience, born in industry and as a consultant. Through this book, Mary wants to provide a go-to guide for small business owners when it comes to health and safety management within their organisations. Mary joins us now to tell us about how to get health and safety right. Mary, how has health and safety management changed throughout your 30-year career? Good morning, Carl, and thanks for having me. Well, I suppose when I got into it in the early days in, in 1989, it was a very undeveloped discipline. Nobody knew anything about it. It was well developed in the UK and the US, but not here. The only qualification anybody could do back then was a basic certificate, which is what the company I worked for, a company called Bausch & Lomb in Waterford, I was working for at the time. And by the way, I never asked for the health and safety job within <laughs> Bausch & Lomb. I went to work for them as a recruitment specialist in HR and was getting stuck in, moved down from Dublin, moved my family to Dublin to do the job in Waterford. And within a couple of months, I was asked to take on the safety portfolio. So it wasn't something I ever asked for. It was just, look, here's this new act. We need to get to grips with this. We've decided you're the woman who's going to do it. And I said to them, I know nothing about this, but they said nobody else does either. So we all started off <laughs> together, if you like, knowing nothing. I suppose the emphasis way back then was on physical safety, you know, the safety of machines, noise, chemicals, housekeeping, all that kind of stuff where physical injuries could be caused if things weren't managed properly. Now, to some extent, we've got a handle on all of that in terms of health and safety in in Ireland anyway. And we're now moving into issues like well-being, occupational health, you know, motivation, human error. What makes people who are fully trained do the wrong thing on a given day when they knew the right thing to do was something else. And Mary, did it take legislation for businesses to take health and safety seriously? The answer is yes and no. I was lucky in this because I worked for an American company. They just didn't do it because the law said you did it. They worked out very early on, as we all did, that it makes good business sense. So if you can run your production line, have no interruptions, nobody injured, nobody going off to be doctored up by a nurse or by a first aider, and you can get your product out the door at the end of the day on the trucks, that's good for business. So they ran the numbers and they found that if we put a few bob into this and we train people and we guard machines and we provide the right protective gear, we can run our production seamlessly and get the product out the door and everybody makes money. So a lot of the American companies came in with a very sort of business-like approach. And there are still companies who think that health and safety is a huge cost and, you know, that it really isn't worth bothering about. But we're winning that battle, I think, in that, you know, poor safety costs a lot of money. Um, and, you know, it, it's, it's not an option anymore. And the CEO of EasyJet many years ago said, if you think safety is expensive, try having an accident. Absolutely. Couldn't, couldn't agree more. And it's not just the injury to the person or maybe the fatality, but it's the aftermath and the, the family that's left devastated and, you know, the compensation claims and the time away from work and managers having to go and give evidence in court. It's an awful traumatic thing to have to go through. So prevention with a capital P is the business that I'm in and have been for 30 years. And Mary, what are the keys to prevention? Planning, risk assessment, having good competent advice and managers accepting that they don't know everything. In other words, you can have a very highly skilled managing director who runs a very good business, but they may know nothing about health and safety. And they need to accept that fact that they will need professional advice either internally or externally from somebody like me or from an internally qualified person and that they, they don't know it all and that we have a contribution to make which will help the business because health and safety and productivity and efficiency are not in battle at all. They're not in competition. They complement each other. Does the attitude to health and safety in business in Ireland actually very much depend on the sector or industry? One of our worst sectors used to be construction. It has really tidied up its act now because of regulation, because of inspection and because the Health and Safety Authority hounded them, basically. And now the really good builders are really, really good. The smaller ones, we still have work to do. But the two difficult areas we have not crossed in this country, well, there's three really. Farming is still a dangerous sector. Fishing is a very dangerous sector. And mines and quarries would be the third one. We're still having horrendous injuries in those areas and they're proving to be difficult not to crack. And in all of these cases, is it true to say that the tone is set at the top? Oh, absolutely. If you, I mean, if I get a chance to speak to only one person in an organisation, 
then give me the chief executive, the managing director, whatever you call him or her. And, and the second person I want to talk to is the finance person. Because I can point out to them if I can get a, an idea of what access they're having or what claims they're having. I can do some quick statistics and tell them, look, you're, using, you're losing money, hand over fist here. And if you do this, this and this, I can save you a packet of money. And when you get the finance people switched on and they can see where the savings are, that will motivate them to invest in it. Now, small companies are expected, of course, to meet the same health and safety requirements as larger companies, but without the resources of the bigger companies. This must lead to problems for small businesses, Mary. Yes, it does, because not only are they dealing with health and safety laws, which they know nothing about, they've got employment law, GDPR, waste regulations. You take a small corner shop employing five or six part-timers, they're lucky if they can pay the wages on a Friday and pay the supplier who gives them milk and bread. I mean, it's a real, it's a real challenge for them to keep the doors open. And we're expecting them to study health and safety, know what applies to them, and more importantly, how to implement it. It just can't be done. So the reality is many, many small companies are doing nothing. Now, doing nothing is not an option. It's not a policy. It's not an approach that I agree with. And they don't have the money to bring somebody like me in because, you know, I'm I'm a consultant who charges fees. So they're doing nothing. And yet they're having accidents. A customer comes in, trips on a mat, slips on a spillage of milk, and they have a problem. So... That's, that's the problem we're face, faced with at the moment and nobody is really addressing it except me in terms of the book. What are the potential repercussions for businesses that breach health and safety legislation today? Well, it depends on the offence. I mean, there's, a whole, there's different grades of offence, if you like, and it depends on what way the Health and Safety Authority classifies it. But th- there could be two cases from any one instance. You can have an incident, say, in a shop, somebody falls, somebody has a serious injury, There can be a prosecution taken by the Health and Safety Authority because they believe the shop broke health and safety law under whatever section. And if it's a medium-grade offence, it will be dealt with in the district court. If it's a very serious offence, it gets brought up into the High Court where the fines are unlimited. Um, In in the district court, the fines can be up to €5,000 per offence, and there's never just one offence, there's always two or three. But at the same time, the same injury can lead to a compensation claim taken by the injured person or by that injured person's family. And that can run into thousands, depending on the level of injury and are they going to recover or is the injury permanent or are they now permanently disabled and not able to work at all. So all of that comes out of the wash. And if if a huge compensation claim is paid out, then that impacts on their employer's liability insurance and that premium goes up. So it costs them more money because they're now considered a higher risk by their insurer. And Mary, generally speaking, what are the most common mistakes that businesses make when it comes to health and safety? They don't plan enough. They go off to buy a machine. They don't think about the machine they're buying. Is it CE marked, which means it has to conform with the relevant EU directive? Is it as as quiet as they can get it? Is it well guarded? Who's going to install it? And more importantly, who's going to train their staff to use it? And then once it's installed, who's going to maintain it? over time. That is not necessarily thought of. They see a bargain, or there's a machine I want to buy, there's a thousand euro off that, I'll go and buy it. And they haven't thought it through at all. We want them to buy the best machinery they can buy, uh, the best quality, the best guarded, and then have it properly installed and have people trained and so on. If they thought about it a little more, they wouldn't make half the mistakes they make. But equally, when they hire people, they need to check if somebody comes in for an interview and says, I'm a qualified uh, fitter, but well, how do we know you're a qualified fitter? We need to check that what you're saying is true because we're going to put you working on machines that a qualified fitter knows how to fix. So we've got to make sure that people are what they say they are. And if they're not fully up to speed with your machines because they've worked in a different industry, then we have to train them to bring them up to that level so that they are competent doing the job. Competence is one of the bedrocks of health and safety, training, planning, and obviously risk assessment looking at all the risks that you have and trying to either eliminate them or control them. And that can be done. It doesn't, you know, if you can't afford the Rolls-Royce solution to the problem, because you may be a small business, there would be a Morris Minor solution to the problem, which is better than doing nothing. Mary, you recently published a book called Safety Sorted. What inspired you to do this? I just felt that there was nothing out there for small businesses, Carl, in that um, large businesses have their own in-house health and safety people. I used to be one. And they're busy. These, you know, Some companies have three and four qualified health and safety people. And these, 
people are busy keeping up to date with all of this and implementing it and making sure it's, it's all the records are being kept. And we expect the small business to do the same thing. It's asking too much. So my feeling was, let's, let's solve a problem here in that these companies, these small businesses, don't know they need this book. But if they want to take health and safety seriously, every small business in Ireland needs my book. And it's a very easy read. It's a non-technical document. I've taken all the legal jargon out of it. I've written it in a no-nonsense, layman's way. A child of 10 could read this book and understand it. And it works in a logical sequence from A to Z. And it covers a whole raft. It covers 33 health and safety topics. It has 18 cases in it to illustrate what went wrong in other businesses and what lessons can be learned. And equally, when I talk about risk assessments or I talk about safety inspection checklists, I'm giving examples of those at the back. There's eight appendices at the back with sample risk assessments, sample safety inspection checklists. I've given all the safety signs that they might need to know about what they look like and, more importantly, what they mean. And equally, a whole section on chemical labels what they look like and what they mean. It's all in one place for them. It's never been gathered into one place before because nothing like this book exists. Safety Sorted addresses many of the typical health and safety hazards which can arise within the workplace, such as working with machinery and equipment, electrical issues and trips and falls. But you've also dedicated a section to remote working. Many companies don't understand this. If, if I'm a remote worker working for Joe Bloggs in Waterford, He still has a duty of care to me, even though I'm working in my house. And he's got to make sure that my work setup in my house is reasonably okay in terms of the chair, the computer, or the laptop, or whatever he's given me, or if I supply it myself. In other words, I should not be sitting on a wad of foam on a kitchen table, moving everything across when people are having dinner, and then moving it back again the following morning. There has to be a a questionnaire done about the person's workstation and maybe even a Zoom review of their workstation to make sure it meets regulations. Because if anything happens to that person ergonomically or whatever else, the company can still be held to be liable, even though that person isn't physically on their site at all. From a record-keeping perspective, what responsibilities are placed on employers and how should these requirements be managed? Well, health and safety is sadly all about keeping records because in the world of health and safety, saying that you did something or saying that you trained the person or saying that you maintained that machine means nothing unless you've got the paperwork to back it up. So training records, first of all, would be a huge issue. And I've dedicated a whole section to training records and the importance of training. If you don't have records, say you've given the person training, then they were never trained. If you have no records to say you did a risk assessment of that particular task or that work activity, then you never did one. If that machine was maintained by a guy last week and he never did a report or never wrote down what he fixed or what he replaced or what he greased or what he lubricated, then that machine was never maintained last week. So record keeping, whether we love it or we hate it, is absolutely crucial to prove that you did what you said you did, because your word against mine is worth nothing in court. It's all about paperwork. Risk assessments are something you mentioned a number of times during the interview this morning. When and how should they be conducted, Mary? Well, ideally, a risk assessment should be done at the beginning of the process. So if you're thinking of bringing in a new machine or making a new product or developing a new service, whatever it might be, risk assessment should start straight away. What does that mean? What equipment are we bringing in? What kind of risks is that going to bring in? Um, who do we need to train? Who's going to develop all this? How are we going to run the product? Whatever it might be, risk assessment starts at the very beginning and should inform your decision making about equipment, about the staff you need to hire, about the training they're going to need, about the tools they're going to need and so on. Um, And it's done by observing what's going on, asking questions, what could go wrong here? What's that over there? What if that falls off? What if that becomes loose? What if that comes down ahead of time? What if that button doesn't work? Whatever. Um, And you've got to look at all the possible worst case scenarios and then you've got to put in control measures which make sure that that can't happen. As we look to the future Mary, where do you see the next generation of updates coming in health and safety legislation? I mean they're getting into well-being. Well-being is a huge issue now and trying to get people happy at work and motivated at work having eliminated all the major hazards. We're also looking at the sort of 
you know, if you're working for Facebook or you're working for Twitter or something and you're reviewing some of the, the posts that people are putting up, some of them might be very distasteful, they might be violent, they might be pornographic, they might be completely unacceptable to you and me. But somebody has to view them, vet them and make a decision about them. And the people reviewing all that material can be traumatised by the material they're forced to look at. And that's an area we never thought about. And those people need a break, you know, from that, from looking at screens, looking at that unacceptable material. So there's all that going on um, that people need to understand. It might just be in an office, you know, with a pair of headphones and you're looking at a screen, but it's purely traumatic what they're having to review and make decisions and rank it as acceptable or not acceptable or whatever. So that's a whole new area that's opened up that we never really thought about. And there's guidance about that now coming out. I mean, the Health and Safety Authority is very proactive in these areas um, and they're doing their best to help people. But, um, you know, all this guidance takes time to read and study and implement. And, you know, small businesses, if we get back to small businesses, they don't have the time to go looking at what the latest piece of guidance is um, because it might apply to them. And even if it did, how on earth do I implement it anyway? And that's what my book is trying, that's the problem my book is trying to solve. Where can people pick up a copy of the book, Mary? They can pick up a copy in the book centre in Waterford, either physically or online with the book centre in Waterford, or they can uh, buy it on Amazon. Now, it's on Amazon.de, which is a German site. It is not available on Amazon.co.uk because of Brexit. Well, if you've just tuned in, that was Mary Darlington from Darlington Consulting and the author of Safety Sorted, and it's definitely a must read for every small business owner. Southeast Radio's Business Matters with Carl Fitzpatrick.